which is from Canada, um, there's two companies. There's TD Canada Trust, which is the parent company, and then here in the States, we're known as TD Bank. We're an American corporation with a, with a Canadian parent. Um, TD Bank is a, uh, we sell to Fannie and Freddie, but we also portfolio. So the nice thing is we're like a hybrid. We can do any type of Fannie Mae product that's out there pretty much, um, but if it doesn't fit into Fannie Mae's box, we have a portfolio where we can put it in. So if there's a, a deal that, you know, for instance, a non Fannie Mae approved condo, let's say, I could probably do a portfolio on it. Um, it's what I like to call common sense lending. You know, we don't give away the house. Yes, exactly. Yeah, portfolio means, uh, for, for those of you that, that, that don't know, um, a portfolio lender means we're not going to sell it on the secondary market to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or another investor. It stays in-house. It's what we call putting it on the shelf where we actually keep it in the bank. Um, we could sell it in the future if there's, you know, if there's an appetite for it, but we keep it in-house. Um, so that's the nice thing. There's no outside investor that has to approve it. Um, it's, it's like I said, if it doesn't fit inside Fannie Mae's box, we can do it. And we do a lot of that. You know, we probably, it's half-half, probably half Fannie Mae, half portfolio that, that we do. Um, TD's a very strong bank. We didn't take any TARP money back in the day. The stock price right now, I think, is in probably in the mid-70s. There's not too many banks that can say that. Um, and obviously, being a portfolio lender, we have a lot of money. Because if you, in order to portfolio a loan, you have to put aside reserves for that loan. So that's why you see most banks nowadays don't have a portfolio they have to sell because they're just not well capitalized. So that, that's the great thing about, about TD Bank. Okay, we'll talk about some of the financing that we can do. Um, <coughs> conventional financing is, as I said before, that's, that's your typical Fannie Mae uh, Freddie Mac type product. Um, it's the cutoff on that is four hundred and seventeen thousand. So anything f uh, of loan amount, not purchase price, the loan amount of four hundred and seventeen thousand or less is considered conventional. Anything over that is considered jumbo. It's considered a jumbo jumbo product. Uh huh. Uh, and what we offer that a lot of other lenders don't is we can do ninety percent financing with no. PMI with no mortgage insurance. Now, why is that good for your customer? Well, two things. Number one, when you do 90% financing with PMI, PMI is not tax deductible. So if you're, for instance, your mortgage insurance premium is $150 a month, that just goes right out the window. You cannot write that off. Whereas the way we do, and, and the second thing is with PMI, um, the way we do it, if we do, if we do do a PMI deal, we have to send it out to the uh, private mortgage insurance company for a second underwriting. And so theoretically, we could say yes to the loan, and then the PMI company could say no, and then you don't have a deal. Whereas the way we do it, in most cases, we do what they call an 80-10-10. What that means is um, your customer gets 90% financing, but the way it's broken down is they put a 10% down payment, we do an 80% first mortgage, and a 10% home equity line of credit behind it. Now, why is that good? Well, number one, you don't have the second level approval from PMI because we do everything in-house. All of our underwriting and processing is done in-house. So once we approve the loan, that's it. It's, you know, we don't have to say, we don't say to you, hey, we've approved it, but I have to wait for my investor to get final approval. No, once TD Bank approves it, that's it. There's no outside investor that we have to wait on or anything. So that obviously speeds up the process. But more importantly, with that extra 10% down, I'm sorry, with the 10% home equity line of credit, it's tax deductible because it's a home equity line of credit. The mortgage interest that they pay on that is tax deductible. And it's a true line of credit. So what does that mean? Well, if we give them, say, a $10,000 line of credit, they will uh, inevitably pay that down but the line of credit stays there. So if they want to use it again in the future, you know, to do the kitchen, the bath, or whatever, it's available to them to use. And the way it works is uh, it's an interest-only payment. They can pay principal if they like, but it's a 10-year interest-only. Um, so the, the line is open for 10 years, and they can use it however they see fit. So that's, that, that's the great thing about it. And uh, there's very, very few banks that, that are doing that right now um, in 80-10-10. Most of them are doing... 90% um, financing with PMI. 
I'm sorry? Uh, it's no harder to qualify than anything else. The credit score is higher on that. Um, you need a 740 mid FICO to get the 80 10 10. Um, we can do uh, an 80 15 5 where the customer uh, um, has to put down 15% and then we'll do an 85 what they call CLTV and I can get away with uh, on a conventional about a 710 FICO with that yeah 710 yeah which is not really high yeah not really high you know the other one 740 a lot of people have it but there's still some people that have you know credit challenges from 2009 2010 um, but I, I do a lot of 80 10 10s you know you'd be surprised and and again because we're a portfolio lender if they don't have the 740 FICO and we're pretty close and we can show that hey the reason why they don't have the 740 FICO is because they have large credit card balances or something that doesn't have to do with delinquencies I can get exceptions on occasion with something like that so that that's the good thing about us we're not hard and fast um, we will make exceptions if there's a compelling reason to do it um, it th they fluctuate every day I'll, I'll show you my website but basically right now our 30-year fix I think is running about four and a half and then our jumbo is running I think about four and three eighths um, yeah, and then we have a whole array of products. Um, you can actually just go right on my website. We post the rates there every day. I can also give them to you, but then there's a tool on my website where it says rate quote. So if you're with a customer and you can't reach me for whatever reason or I'm with another another broker here, um, you can go into my website, hit rate quote, just fill, fill in a couple drop-down boxes, and then boom, it'll give you all the rates for that day, all the different options, points, no points. It's right there. It's all public knowledge, so we don't there's no hiding rates with us it's all right there on the website it's all public I'm not gonna tell you you know uh, for you I'm gonna give you four and a quarter for you I'm gonna give you four and a half no we don't do that everything everything is transparent uh, yes the question was do we do FHA um, yes we do I'll, I'll get to that on, a, on another slide yeah um, the other uh, thing is <coughs> excuse me condo projects are approved internally developer controlled associations are acceptable non Fannie Mae approved condos okay what that means is if you have a cond condominium uh, that is not on Fannie Mae's approved list chances are we can get it approved um, now what we do is you know we'll ask for documentation and I'll, I'll handle that but I've done a few non Fannie Mae approved condos uh, most of them down south you know in the West Palm Miami area but um, we can do doesn't matter where they are. I mean, I'm doing one in Daytona right now that's non Fannie Mae approved. As a matter of fact, we're the only lender in there right now. The MG. Yeah, the MG. Yeah, we're the only lender in there right now. And that, that thing has a million exceptions on that. Yeah. Yeah, we're the only one that can do it because that, that thing, it's got pending litigation. It doesn't have the pre sale. It's, but it, it's a good project. I mean, it's financially, it's fine. See, and that's the thing about us. We looked at it and we said, okay. The reserves are good. Everything else looks good. Their insurance is fine. So, you know, we'll go ahead and, and, and do this. And as a matter of fact, we did it last year before we even had the pre-sale. Normally, our pre-sale was 25% sold and closed. We started doing it at 23, which I had to beg, borrow, and steal to get that done. But <laughs> we end up, that's what I mean. We will do, you know, we'll take a look at stuff that makes sense. And, you know, typically, if it makes sense, we'll do it. And if we can't, um, the person I go to in Maine, um, she is very fair, and if she can't do it, there'll be a compelling reason why she can't. But um, she's a deal maker. You know, she wants us uh, to get loans in, and like I said, if it makes sense, she will do it. She's she's very very fair like that. So if you do get a non Fannie Mae approved condo, chances are we could do it. The only time we're going to have a real issue is if you have one of these condominiums where like 90% of them are investor owned or 80% are investor owned. That's a tough one to get done. Typically, our appetite is we, we don't like to see more than 50% investor owned. Um, unless somehow we can, yeah, we can go up to 50% investor owned. And then sometimes we're able to run it through. Fannie Mae has a quick, what they call PRM uh, website that we can go in and, and run it through. I just did a deal in Miami where it was 65% um, investor owned, and I was able to get it through. Um, because the financials were good. Now I'm not gonna. I can't promise you that on every deal, but that one I was able. I was able to do.
Mm -hmm. How did the bank look at that? Okay, the question was, if a person had a short sale previously, how do we look at that? Um, the answer is, it depends on how many years have passed, and it depends on the circumstances. Normally, they want to see about five years have passed on the short sale. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter unless we're doing FHA. FHA is a different story, but on a, on a conventional, we normally like to see five years. Now, is that hard and fast? No. We will go as little as three years um, with what they call extenuating circumstances. Now, what does that mean? It's really up to the underwriter's discretion. Let's say he, uh, the individual lost his job. Um, and he couldn't find work for a year, and he had to let his rental property go rather than his primary, or he had, you know, big medical bills, something like that. Yeah, again, it depends. And the question was, uh, if he's back on his feet, um, you know, will we? how are we going to look at the short sale? <clears throat> and it's really, it's a case-by-case -case basis. It's really a case-by-case -case basis. Um, with that one, it's kind of tough because now he's looking to buy investment properties. So that's going to, they're going to look at that a little bit harder than let's just say, you know, he's going to buy a primary residence. It's not to say we can't get it done. But th they are going to look at it harder than uh, on an investment property than they would on a primary residence. So again, it all depends on on, on the circumstances. But mm -hmm. yeah, I would say if you could get he w w yeah, well, well, they're going to want to see um, circumstances surrounding it. So I recently had a short sale. Um, not myself, but one of my customers, and I told them, do me a favor, write a letter explaining exactly what happened, and, and keep in mind that the underwriters are human beings. You know, you can put, you know, if something happened, you know, and you need to get a little bit emotional about it, that's okay. You know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be published in the paper. And she wrote, you know, she t said what happened. There was medical s bills, and uh, she lost her job, and her dad was sick and had to take care of her. And then um, we got it approved. Because, but she was buying a primary residence, and her credit score was back up over 700, and she was putting she was putting 20 percent down. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we 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 could look at it, but like I said, because he's buying investment properties, they probably are going to look at it a little bit harder. Yeah, a little harder. I'm not, I wouldn't say harsh, but you know, will they make an exception on a rental property versus an owner occupied? Owner occupied, they're going to be more lenient. Investment properties, they're going to look at it and say, okay, we need a compelling reason here. So, um, no, that's okay. Okay, the other thing that we can do uh, is, and I know a lot of you don't deal with it, but you probably should, we can do Canadian citizens. They can finance a second home here in the U.S. with 20% down, same rate as a U.S. borrower. Now, there's no other bank out there that can say that because any bank that does foreign national lending jacks up the rate on, on the, proper, on the um, mortgage. Um, and they require, you know, typically 30, 35% down. Yeah, yep. And the sound also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what, what I would say, because I do a ton of Canadian business, I would say if you can try to partner with someone up in Canada, another broker, or if you, you know, if any of you can go up there and maybe do a seminar because I know local realtors that do that and they get a boatload of business up there. And the other thing is also, not just to toot my own horn, if you tell them that you're affiliated with TD Bank, 
you get instant credibility because TD Bank is a huge bank up in Canada and it's a well-respected name up there. So if you tell them, hey, I can provide you financing through TD Bank, I have a local loan rep that, that does a lot of Canadian loans and can, you know, can guide you through the process, that, that's huge. And um, I just have a quick, um, if you all send me your, uh, or give me your business cards at the end, I have a quick um, just bullet point uh, Canadian um, loan program guide kind of that you can even forward you know to your prospective customers just to let them know what we can do um, so yeah we can do like I said 20 percent down on a second home they do not have to have US credit we pull Canadian credit um, and we base everything in Canada so we look at their Canadian tax returns Canadian bank statements everything they do not have to have anything here in the US at all so that, that's the great thing about that um, and they're also eligible to buy an investment property with 25% down. Um, that's the other thing uh, that we can do. Um, so if they're looking to buy a rental property, 25% down. And the nice thing about that is we use the rent to help them qualify as well. Whereas on a second home, obviously we don't because they're, it's a vacation home or it's supposed to be. Um, but with an investment property, we can do it with 25% down. Same rate as a U.S. borrower, but we use the rent to help them qualify. No, the question was, what's the difference between a second home and investment property? Um, and if, if you tell me that your customer is buying a second home, we're assuming that he's never going to rent it out. So that's what's called a second home. Now, once if he tells me he's buying a, uh, an investment property, then we say, okay, we can take the rent to help them qualify, and then they just have to put an extra 5% down. That's the difference. Now, you know, it really depends. A year from now, if he decides to rent that vacation home, can he? We, we really can't stop him. Um, that's really, you know, his choice. But on the initial application, uh, on the initial application, um, we have to put down as a, a vacation home. Okay. <laughs> okay. But that's it's really for for qualifying purposes. And also also you get a little um on an investment property we can only do a 30 year fixed rate whereas on a second home they get the whole array of products in uh adjustables or uh fixed. Okay. Was there any other questions about the um about the Canadian loan product? Okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up about your Brazilian clients, um, I can't finance them yet, but what I can do is we allow co-signers. So I was telling Daniela this because she thinks she may have someone that may qualify for this. We allow co-signers. So theoretically, if um, you have someone in Brazil and then they have someone here in the States, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, for instance, um, Mr. and Mrs. Jones can sign on the mortgage for your customers in Brazil. The difference is the people in Brazil do not appear on the mortgage application. They're on the deed. They could be on the deed. They'll be, you know, co-owners. Um, but the people here in the U.S. can sign on it, and then they would, uh, it would, they would have to be on the deed as well when they initially, um, when they initially apply. Correct. So that's, that's, that's correct. Okay. So that's correct. Either, that's correct. It could be in all four people's names. Four. Yeah, it could be in all four names. But the people that are signing in the U.S. are responsible for that loan. The people in Brazil are not. Yeah. The question was, do they need to be related? Um, Co-signers don't have to be don't have to be related. They they prefer if they're related, but they also understand that there's business relationships. So I've done that before with some of my Canadian customers, where um, they would have. Uh, four people on the loan and only actually one person is going to own the property so you know you can do that um, so if you if you have someone that's here in the states and they have a relative in brazil we can help finance them or the other the other thing is is if uh, say a brazilian's here and they have a work visa they're not a u.s citizen but they're filing u.s returns we can do that we can do that with a work visa and they're filing u.s returns but they have to have u.s credit um, so but if they're if they're straight from Brazil, unfortunately, right now I can't do it. 
Yeah. I'm just thinking, you know, like I said, probably one, two, three percent of your customers would have that, but at least it's an option. You know. Yeah. No, it's it's definitely an option. Uh, it could be both. It could be vacation home, or it could be a a, a rental property. You know. Yeah, one one is twenty percent down, and one is. R oh yeah, oh yeah. No, I could do that. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's the same. The thing is, though, if a local is going to buy, you really can't say a local is going to buy a vacation property here because they live here. Um, so that would be an investment property. But if they live in another part of Florida, because um, I I I had the same question. Our underwriting department is up in Maine and in South Carolina. Um, some of them understand Florida, some of them don't. I had someone say to me. Why is someone from Miami buying a vacation home in Orlando? And I explained to them, and I said, well, look, you have to understand something. In Florida, there's different types of vacations. In Miami, you've got the beach, you've got the city, um, you know, you've got all, all, right, you've got, right, you've got everything down there. In Orlando, it's Disney World golf. And I said, and, and it was true. The person wanted a second home up here so they can come. They didn't want to keep driving up and down the turnpike all day long. So I got it approved because we explained it like that. And the same thing, someone in Orlando buying a property in Miami, same thing. I said they're buying it for the beach, they're buying it for its international, um, that type of thing. Or someone in Orlando buying something in Naples, we could say that it's a vacation home because Orlando is not by the beach. So, you know, with explanation, it, it has to make sense. But when initially, when I put that in, the people in Maine said to me, what are you talking about? And then we explained it and said, you know, it's, yeah, and, and that's the thing. But that's what I mean about the bank because – once you explain it to them, there's people that make actual common sense decisions. It's not just, well, he's in Florida, we can't have a second home. No, that doesn't that doesn't make any sense. So we're able to do it. Um, the question was, people retired from Canada. You mean, can they buy a house down here? Yeah. Right. Uh, no, no, it, it, it depends on their income because we, when we underwrite our customers, they're all underwritten the same. So we're looking at their income, credit, and uh, equity, you know, meaning down payment. So if they have enough income, um, absolutely. I did, uh, down in Port St. Lucie, I did a retired Canadian couple. Um, they wanted to buy a small place, and they just had pension and uh, um, our RRSPs, and we qualified them like that, just like we would an American. Yeah, as long as we've got the proof of the cash flow. That's fine. Yeah, they don't have to be working. They could be retired. Yeah. Yep. Yep, we can do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. We can. As yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, the other thing, too, is um, to answer that question about the retired people in Canada, um, they can get a relative or someone else to co-sign for them in Canada. That's the other thing. You know, if they have a son, because I'm, I'm dealing with this right now. There's a couple, um, he just met with me Friday. They don't show enough income. He's self-employed because he's hiding all his income. But he's got a son that makes a good salary. So I said, well, have your son co-sign with you because he wants to buy a vacation home down here. I said, that's perfectly acceptable. So that's what he's going to do. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, the question was, is the cosigner going to be on the mortgage? Yes, the cosigner is as equally responsible on that loan as the primary signer. So it's just like if you cosign for a car loan, if you cosign for your daughter and she doesn't make the payments, the bank's coming after you. Correct. Correct. Yeah. No, the other if, if, if what I'm saying, if, he, if he's Brazilian and he doesn't have any U.S. credit or anything. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, he would not be a cosign. He'd be a co-owner. He would be on the deed, but he wouldn't be on the loan. So if they have a U.S., if they have a family member or, or friend here in the U.S. that wants to co-sign for someone from Brazil, the person from the U.S. is solely responsible for that loan. The person from Brazil they're not on our loan documents, so.
correct. The cosigner is the only one that, that that's approved. Yeah. Yeah, the person in Brazil we don't even look at because they're not on the loan application. question was if um, the cosigner already has financing here in the states how do they qualify um, what we do is we're gonna look at the whole picture so say for instance you wanted to co-sign for your mom in Brazil we're gonna look at your income and all of your debts so as long as you can carry both homes you're fine so that that's basically how we would do it so we're gonna again we're gonna look at their total income their total debts and make sure that they can carry both homes uh, you know with just your income Yes, I'll I'll get to that in a, in a in a second. Uh, yeah, the question was is is there uh, can I do an FHA age restriction community? Um, I'll have to find out. I haven't done one of those with FHA. I've done them in the portfolio. We haven't had an issue. I have to double check to see if FHA has an issue with uh, age restrictions. Um, is it a condominium or is it a uh, is it a um, single family house okay yeah sorry i i have a question on the 60 68 year old age mm -hmm. you know the wife of the the oh. that that kind of thing the farm is going to work so right yeah well a fha won't do second homes it's only primary residences and i'll i'll, I'll get to that in a second Yeah, sure. Yeah, not a problem. We can, we can, uh, you know, if you want to call me, we can, we can strategize on the phone, or I can after the meeting, I can sit down with you. Yeah, not a problem. No problem. Okay. Um, the next thing we do is if you get any clients <coughs> that are looking to build a home, we can do construction loans, what they call a construction perm loan. Uh, it's a one-time closing. Uh, we can do eighty percent financing up to one and a half million dollar um, loan amount. So that, that's a good option to have if you have someone that's, you know, working with a custom builder and they want to build their own home, we're, we're able to do that. Um, there's not a lot of construction loan lenders out there right now. Uh, and then we can do loan amounts up to $3 million with 30% down. And again, it's a one-time close. Um, basically, we close on the mortgage and we start the uh, interest-only period. We give, give the money to the builder. And then at the end, we have a modification. So it's not two closings, it's only one closing. And that saves the client thousands of dollars in, in you know, transfer taxes and title costs and everything. And there you go, one time closing with 12 month build. Uh, fixed rate from the time of initial closing, so we give them a 30 year fixed rate. Okay, here we go with FHA. Um, <coughs> What's the good thing about FHA? Well, you can do up to 96.5% financing, but it's for own owner-occupied properties only. So I can't do that on investment properties. I can't do that on second homes, unfortunately. Um, as a matter of fact, <coughs> I'm doing an FHA product for a, um, an English woman. She's here. She's not a U.S. citizen. She has work papers. She's filed returns for the last two years. She has one line of credit but I'm building alternative credit. So FHA will accept someone on a work visa as long as they filed U.S. returns and we have some sort of credit we can hang our hats on. So if it's an owner-occupied property, chances are um, that person that's here on a work visa, I can, I can get done. They, they do not have to be U.S. citizens to, to qualify for FHA. Okay, it's great for your first-time home buyers because, again, um, you only need 3.5% down payment. So, you know, a young married couple that's just starting out typically doesn't have 20%, 30% to put down. So this is a great product for them. Uh, the other great thing about it is the FICO score can be as low as a 640. So you don't have to have letter-perfect credit with FHA. Uh, and the other beauty of it is, is <coughs> that 3.5% down, 
can be a gift from a family member. So theoretically, if a young married couple goes to mom and dad and they say, hey, we need you know $10,000 for a down payment, they can get the whole down payment. So in essence, it's almost like 100% financing, FHA, if you, if you can get the gift uh, from a family member. Now, again, the definition of a family member, <clears throat> you know, could it theoretically be from an aunt and an uncle? Yes, it all depends on the underwriter that you're dealing with. I've had, you know, fiancés give gifts and they've been acceptable. But, you know, again, it's, it's all to the interpretation of the underwriter. But if it's mom and dad giving a couple um, money, not a problem. Not a problem. So, like, uh, no, because on a gift, like, say, for, yeah, 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 the question was, does, does the gift have to be in an account for a certain period of time? The answer is no, um, because say, for instance, your mom and dad say to you, hey, we're going to give you $10,000 to buy your house. They can give it to you tomorrow. What we're going to want to see is a gift letter <coughs> written by them, basically stating that they're going to give you $10,000 and no repayment is expected. And then we just need to see that um, deposit uh, coming into your account. <clears throat> and typically, we do not ask for what they call donor's ability. Donor's ability means, um, say, for instance, your mom and dad wanted to give you money. Some lenders will say, well, we want to see mom and dad's bank statements to see that they actually have the 10000 We typically do not ask for that. I haven't seen an underwriter in, in my bank ask for that ever. Now, they do have the right to ask, ask for it <clears throat> if they suspect something might be going on. But so far, um, I haven't seen it happen yet. So typically, we do not ask for donors' ability. We just need to see the need to see the transfer into um, our customers' um, bank account. Uh, and we could do condos with FHA. Uh, the only downside is the condos must be on the FHA approved list. And you can go to the FHA website and pull it down. <clears throat> I can do it for you. There's a number of condos that are approved in Orlando in the Orlando area. Um, down south, if you're dealing down south, you know, in the West Palm, Miami area, a lot of them aren't FHA approved anymore because they've let their FHA approvals expire for various reasons. Um, so you, down south, you're not going to see a lot of FHA approved condos. Around here, there's more. But again, you know, you could check the website or you can call me and I could look it up for you or send me an email and I can, I can look it up. So that, that's the only uh, downside to the FHA condo. It must be on their approved list. But once it is, three and a half percent down you know for condo which is which is nice again has to be owner occupied is there any questions on fha no okay okay the other product that we have <coughs> excuse me is uh va and va can provide up to a hundred percent financing um so you know that's always a good product to have va does not have any minimum minimum fico scores but they do look at the repayment history you know, years ago, you could have the worst credit in the world and get a VA loan. Nowadays, not so much. Um, th again, they don't have a minimum FICO score, but if you have someone that has foreclosures, bankruptcies, um, you know, just bad credit all around, chances are VA is going to turn that down. Um, they're looking at the ability to repay. <clears throat> they want to see that, you know, was it a one-time thing that he had bad credit, or is this a continuous thing? And if it's a continuous thing for, you know, five, six years, chances are VA is not going to approve that one. Um, uh, same thing with the condos. They must be on the VA approved list. And um, obviously you must be an active or retired military veteran to get the VA loans. Um, we don't do a lot of them. There's not <coughs> we don't really get a lot of call for them um, because the rates are about the same as conventional. And, um, you know, there's a lot of paperwork involved with the, with the VA financing so you know we don't really do a lot of them we have it there you know it's you do get that, that occasional customer but I don't really see a lot of it happening I think in other states you see it you have to get you know Texas and the Carolinas more so down here I don't really see a lot of it but it's there as an option if you you know if you want to use it or if you run across a client that has it okay and our next product is <coughs> which is uh, near and dear to your hearts because that's where you make the most money jumbo loans Okay, a jumbo loan is described as anything over 417000 So those are going to be your properties in, you know, Windermere, Lake Mary. Those are the properties you want to sell, right, because you get the bigger commission on them. Um, but we can do, uh, again, we can do 90% uh, financing on those. I think we're the only lender out there that can do this right now. 
on purchase prices up to two and a half million dollars. And what we do is the same thing as before in the conventional. We do an 80-10-10 um, and it has to be owner occupied and it has to be a single family that we can do that on. But you know, if you do have that client that doesn't want to put a lot of equity into a property, we have that ability to finance 90% on a jumbo. Uh, again, <coughs> no mortgage insurance required. It's an 80-10-10 program. Uh, all bo borrowers are eligible, not restricted to doctors or professionals. Because there, there, there are some lenders out there that will do 100% financing or 90% financing for doctors and lawyers. They have these special programs. This, you could be, doesn't matter what, what field you're in. We'll, we'll give it to anyone as long as you qualify for it. And then we have obviously other, you know, we can go up to $12 million um, with an increased down payment. We, ha we really have no maximum loan amount. So, I mean, you know, theoretically, if you wanted to get one of those, you know, uh, properties around the lake in Windermere, that's, you know, 20, 25 million, uh, we could finance that. Um, it goes, it's on an exception basis. It goes to loan committee. Typically, I would say if you get those mega mansions, they're probably going to want 25 30 percent down i don't think i could do 80 percent financing but i don't ever want to say never because if you get someone that's super strong and they want 80 percent financing i present it to the loan committee and they may say they may sign off on it and say yes because you know this person may have you know billions of dollars in the bank and they see how how strong that person is and so you know theoretically we could do that but uh again we hold those in the portfolio so um anything over three million on a loan amount goes to loan committee so hopefully uh, we'll get a lot of those from you guys. <laughs> and our jumbo rates, I think, are the best in the market. That's where you can find the rates. That That's my website, and it's on my card as well. Um, and we offer, you know, 30-year fixed, adjustables. The one product that we have, which a lot of banks don't, is what's called a 15-1. And I can do this on another training seminar, but I just want to mention it to you. On the conventional side, the 15-1 is better priced than on the jumbo. But what it is is... 30-year fixed rate a lot of people like, and they say, oh, that's great, it's locked into 30 years. The reality is I can count on one hand how many people keep a loan for 30 years because in the U.S., the average life expectancy of a loan is 7 to 8 years, sometimes 10. And the reason for that is people either move, refinance, sell the home, whatever. <coughs> so we came up with a product called a 15-1. What that is is it's a 30-year amortization with a 15-year fixed rate. And why would you want that versus a 30? Well, two reasons. One, the rate is lower, but two, no one keeps a loan for 30 years. So that rate typically on the conventional is sometimes up to a half a percent lower than a 30-year fix. So I, on the conventional side, I try to sell my customers that. I mean, I give them whatever they want, but I tell them, hey, look, why do you want to pay a half a percent higher and all that interest to the bank if you're going to sell the property in 10 years or retire or whatever, do the 15-1 because at least... It's not like a five- or a seven-year adjustable where you have to worry, oh, my God, this is going to change in five or seven years. Your rate's locked in for 15 years. So as far as I know, we're the only bank out there that has it. So just, you know, some food for thought. Um, but I, I, I want their food. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and on, on, the, uh, on my website, like I said, there's a button uh, that's called Rate Quote, and then you can go um, right on it. Uh, just hit rate quote, and then you can get the um, the actual all the interest rates for that day. Um, and yep, that concludes it. So I'll just open up the floor to a to a Q and A. If anyone has any additional questions, I'm happy to help you. And I'm available seven days a week. I work. I'm like you guys. I don't work banker hours. So if you need me on a Saturday or a Sunday, text me, call me. You know, it's not a problem. I'm local. Um, and I'm always, you know, I'm always willing to help. If you have a scenario you want to run by me, <coughs> questions, you know, whatever. Even if you, you know, if you're dealing with another lender and you want me to take a look at something, I'm, I'm brutally honest. So if, you, if there's another broker out there that's giving your customer a better rate, I'll be honest with you. Say, hey, it's a great rate. Take it. I mean, as much as I hate to lose the business, or just, you know, next time we'll, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get it. But, you know, sometimes you have to read in between the lines. I mean, I just had <coughs> a situation where um, – there was a, uh, a woman that was buying her first home. Her boss called me and said, hey, she's dealing with this guy. And I looked at the good faith estimate, and his rate was the same as mine, but he was charging her $2,000 higher closing costs than I was. So I just, she didn't believe me. 
shocked <laughs> that I was that much lower. So I showed her, I gave her, you know, written estimate, and she goes, okay, I'll go with you. So that's, you know, that's the other thing, you know, if you're not familiar with the good faith or if you're not familiar with lender fees, um, you know, run it by me to make sure your customers are getting the best deal because there's two close two types of closing costs you have the standard florida closing cost title transfer taxes they're all the same doesn't matter where you go it's the lenders fees that you want to look at things like application fees uh, underwriting fees uh, loan documentation fees that type of thing that's what you want to look at we have a flat fee of eight hundred and forty dollars we call it an origination fee it's actually really a processing fee but per new guidelines we have to call it an origination fee so it doesn't matter the loan size it could be a sixty thousand dollar loan it could be a twelve million dollar loan it's eight hundred and forty dollars flat fee that's it we prepare the closing package free so you, you could use your title companies not a problem whoever title company you're, you're affiliated with you can use them we prepare the closing package for free we send it to your title company if we have to do a redraft say for instance whatever the closing the uh, closing gets postponed we do not charge a redraft fee. I think we're the only bank out there that doesn't. I've had closings postponed, you know, for various reasons for the borrower couldn't make it. Um, and we had to redraft documents uh, a couple of times. We don't charge anything additional for that. Um, and uh, we will, you can do a closing where pretty much wherever you want. Um, you know, we'll email the documents to your title company. They could do a remote closing. It doesn't matter. Oh, it's a reverse mortgage? No, we don't do reverse mortgages, unfortunately. Yeah, no, there's, there's, there's a few lenders out there. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a reverse mortgage. Yeah, the, the only, uh, it's good and it's bad. The reverse mortgage, you know, they never have to pay it back. The only thing is from what I've heard, and I can't swear to this, but I've heard this through the grapevine, they have really heavy fees associated with the, with the closings on it. So just alert your clients to that. Get a good faith estimate or, or some sort of worksheet that shows what those closing fees are, um, you know, to make sure they want to go into that. Yeah. They um, recently, th that's what I've heard in, in the recent recent times. Yeah. Yeah. I would just check, but uh, no, we don't, unfortunately, we don't, we don't do that at this time. But, uh, but, uh, On the FHA, age I want to find out if there's an age restriction. Yeah, as a matter of fact, after the meeting, I can call my back desk and uh, I can ask him that question. I can get a pretty quick answer for you on that. Yeah. Um. The question was, do we have renovation loans? Um, yeah. Well, we don't. We don't do. Um, let me put it this way it would fall under the construction loan so theoretically if they want to buy the house and then come back and do a, a renovation loan you know it would be two separate loans we would have to do an acquisition loan for it and then a construction loan now we may be able to blend it into one where we can do um, a construction loan as an acquisition with money in there to, to um, to renovate it it depends depends on the equity involved it depends on the on the customer um, will the property appraise much higher after after the closing not n yeah it's no that's that's <coughs> Yeah, so some of it, it's, yeah, it's, it's that old saying, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Now, there are programs out there. I know we don't do it yet. There's a FHA 203K program where they'll give you acquisition money and a little bit of money to fix up the house. But um, it's not going to be, you know, 80, 90,000 on an FHA 203K. I think they may be capped at 20 or 25,000 on an F but But they do, there are a couple of programs out there like that. Um, ours would be in conjunction with a with a um, uh, construction loan. We would do it as an acquisition. Uh, the question was, how does the appraisal work? Well, basically, what they're going to do is, if we're going to structure it as a construction loan, 
we're going to look at the as completed value of the property. So that would mean we would need plans and specs from the borrower. You know, we'll look at you know what it's worth now, and then the appraiser is going to say, okay, after he does all this work, what is it worth? And then you know that's how we'll base our loan. It's going to be subject to completion and that property appraise. Well, it would have to appraise up front because the appraiser is going to look at the plans and specs and the here and the now. He's going to say, okay, once this house is finished. Yeah, he's claiming it's worth three hundred thousand. It, it will be worth three hundred thousand. So, now the question was, can we finance more than the appraised value? No, no. You mean, in other words, on a regular purchase? Yeah, no. We don't do like one hundred and twenty-five percent financing or anything like that. No. I wish we did in 2006. <laughs> then they're worth, yeah. With the difference, yeah. Now, the way I handle that, I, I don't get that too often. It does happen on occasion because normally, nowadays, the, most of the real estate brokers price them appropriately. But in the, in the off chance that we do get that, I give you the appraisal and I say, okay, Here's what it appraised for. We use we use independent fee appraisers. We don't. No one works for TD Bank. They're they're independent. They're all have their own companies. I give the appraisal to my broker and say, here you go. Present it to the other side and show them what it appraised for. Now we have an appraisal appeal process internally. So say for instance, um, the seller says, hey, this appraiser is crazy. This house is worth three hundred and he only appraised it for two fifty. Does that happen sometimes? Sure. That's why we have an appeal process. So what you can do is you can take that appraisal, go to the other side and say, here it is in writing. You can look at it. We have an appeal form. If they give us three comps that will justify that 300000 we go back to the appraiser and we say, okay, Mr. Appraiser, um, the other side is saying you're crazy that it really should be worth 300000 Here's our justification. We give it to the appraiser. Now the appraiser could say, yes, I agree, or no, I don't. And then... Uh, and, uh, uh, you'd be surprised. I've had a few overturned. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, th that's part of the problem. But I've had a few overturned. I mean, you know, if it's done, and I always tell the other side, make sure it's not emotional. Just put down the facts, you know, be very respectful in the, in, in the appeal. Don't say, ah, you don't know what you're doing, you know, because then right there, that gets someone's back up right away. Um, and I've had a few overturned. I have. But if they don't get overturned, at least the other side sees the appraisal, and they know that we're not just fooling around. Normally what I've seen, ha I haven't seen any deals yet blow up. Normally either the my customer comes out of pocket and pays the difference or they split it. That's what I typically see. Or sometimes the other side says, y th they have a good realtor and they said, yeah, you know what, this is what it's worth. You know, it's only worth 250 It's not worth 300 And then the, uh, then the seller comes to his senses and says, okay, I'll let it go for 250 It all depends on who you're dealing with and their mental state. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's kind of split. It's kind of split. They they will um, uh, they'll split it fifty fifty. My customer will come up with the difference because sometimes they know they're thinking eight nine ten months down the road. You know what this place because you know they hear there's a new development coming in or something. So they know in the future they're buying for future value. So they don't mind coming out of pocket because they know they're going to get that money back within a year. So I've had some people just say okay I'll pay the difference, and then I've had some sellers that'll say. Yeah, you know what? I have it here in black and white. My realtor is telling me this is what it's worth, so I'll capitulate and, and lower my purchase price. But we do have that appeal uh, appraisal appeal process. So it's transparent. Like I said, we're not lying. We give them the appraisal, say, hey, if you could blow holes in it, go ahead. You know, and we'll go back to our appraiser and say, hey, you made a mistake, and then it's up to him or her to decide if they agree with it or not. <laughs> they they ate too much they need a nap <laughs> 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 yeah yeah no they did yeah and and if you, you know if i didn't cover anything call me email me text me you know i'm i'm happy to do i'm you know i'm happy to answer the questions or um or a lot of you new to the business or you've been in the business for a while new okay yeah yeah so you know yeah you're going to have a lot of questions call me the other thing is too what you want to do, most important, get them pre-qualified because I've seen this happen with new agents. 
they take people, you know, because, you know, you want that deal. You take them out, you become a taxi service, you're driving them all over Orlando, and then they have a 500 FICO score, and you're just wasting, and you're just wasting your time, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, because I've seen it happen, because, you know, you want that, I know, I, you know, believe me, I'm, no, I'm on commission like you are, you want that deal, but, you know, you also don't want to waste your time, you want to work on s someone that's actually qualified. Now, the other thing I can tell you, if we get someone that's not qualified, their FICO score is beat up, um, I, I tell them there's a, I don't know if you work with a credit repair agency, but there's someone I know here in Orlando that I can refer them out to, or if you know someone, you can do that. Um, yeah, and I'll, and uh, also I can look at a credit report and tell them, okay, here's what you need to do. We give them the roadmap and say, hey, um, come back in, you know, three, four months. Um, I always tell people, I never tell people you can't buy a house. I may say to them, the timing is wrong, but where there's a will, there's a way, and here's what you need to do. And what I found is most people are very appreciative of that, and when you're honest with them, and you tell them what they need to do, usually they come back to you because they appreciate that. Some don't, but that's, that's life, you know. So, you know, I do, I do work with people like that. Repair their credit. Yeah. 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 Uh, th the question was, how long does it take to repair credit? It really depends on on what's there. Um, I've seen it done in as little as forty five days. I've seen it drag on for for five months. Yeah. Also, also what, what I've seen happen is it depends on when you pull the credit because your FICO score, which really makes me nuts. This is what Congress should be investigating. But anyway, um, if you pay, I, and I've seen this happen time and time again, people that pay their bills on time, never a delinquency in 10 years. But when I pull their credit, they have their visas maxed out, their Bloomingdale's card maxed out, everything's maxed out. That dings your credit score severely. Um, and I don't agree with it, but that's that's what happens. So what I tell people is try to keep your balances at no more than 30 to 40% of the line. So, for instance, if you have a $1,000 Bloomingdale's card, don't charge more than $300, $400, because when I pull it, it all depends on when I pull it, the cycling date and everything. I could pull it at the wrong time of the month where your credit score now is 640. If I wait two weeks, it might be 720. That's, that's the other thing. It's the wacky thing about credit reports. <coughs> I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen. I had a guy. Yeah. 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 It's called utilization of credit. Um, I had a guy from Canada. Uh, I'll tell you a, a perfect story for this. I had a guy from Canada. He was buying a $3 million home in Miami. And um, he had, up in, up in t especially up, up in Canada, TD Bank gives a lot of points on their visa cards. So he had three Visa cards that he used for his business, each with an $80,000 line of credit. He'd max them out every month, pay them off at the end of the month because he got all his free trips to Florida and everything else. I pulled his credit at the wrong time of the month, and his credit score was 640, not enough for us to do a second home. So I looked at it. He didn't have any delinquencies, and I said, okay, Andre, here's what we're going to have to do. He found out when the cycling date was, you know, when they were going to report to the agencies, paid them all down, called me up and said, okay, pull the credit report now, put the application back in, and we were good. And then the next day he went back and <laughs> matched them all out again. <laughs> yeah, but that's what it is. You know, nowadays you, you, you do. You have to be creative. You have to know all those little tricks of the trade. Depends. Well, if they're paid off, that's a good thing. But it, then it's going to depend on their FICO. It's going to depend on their on their FICO score. Yeah, 
he, he's probably a candidate for FHA um, because FHA, by the way, it's not income restricted. Um, it, it has its loan amount restricted, but you could be a millionaire and get FHA. People, that's a misnomer. People think you have to have a certain income level to do FHA. No, it, it restricts you. You're not going to be able to buy a property in Windermere with FHA because they restrict it. I think in Orange County, it's like two. Don't quote me, but I think it's about two seventy is your maximum mortgage on FHA with in Orange County. Um, but you, you doesn't matter. You could make a gazillion dollars and still get FHA. Um, there's no income restrictions on it. That's you know th that's the good thing. Um, so that to answer your question, it's it it really depends on you know what's on yeah it is it is and that's where. Yeah. Yeah, you're better off, you know. Yeah, it, it, it's it's good to know for your own knowledge, but then you're better off just saying, hey, you know what, call Artie, he's the expert, because the last thing you want is the long knives are going to come back at you because they're going to say, Diogo told me, he told me that I could do this, why are you telling me something different? And that's what happens, you know, because people hear what they want to hear, and, you know, you're, you're their first point of contact, and then they're going to say, but, yeah, but my broker told me this, why are you lying to me? And I, I've had that conversation a million times, so... Yeah. You're gonna talk oh. to other people and you really don't know what they're gonna say. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then you know you hear stuff through the grapevine and everything and then you you've got And, you know, and, and everyone's different. I work with real estate brokers that are really, they want to control everything. So, you know, they call me every hour, find out what's going on. There's others that just say, here's the guy's name. I don't want to know until you have him approved. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you know, so it all depends. I can work with both. I mean, you know, it depends how involved you want to be. I don't expect you to do my job. I'm not going to say, hey, go get the pay stubs, go get the W-2s. But if you want to know, hey, what's missing, I'll tell you, okay, we're missing X, Y, and Z. And, you know, we're following up on it. Sure. I mean, I have no problem doing that. But I'm not expecting you to, to chase down paperwork at all. <coughs> yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's the one thing. I speak Spanish a little bit dangerous. But uh, I when I worked, it's funny. When I used to work back in New York, I worked for a place called Yonkers Savings and Loan. We had a heavy Portuguese population and not, not so much Brazilian, mostly Portuguese. And uh, they were trying to teach me Portuguese. And it was difficult for me because I would look at it and the sounds were so different. And he told me, he said, if you, and I don't know how true this is, but if you speak Portuguese, it's easier to learn Spanish. But if you speak Spanish, it's harder to learn Portuguese. Because I would look at it and I was like, because there was a lot of, the pronunciation was just so different to me. That, that That's what it was. I, I pick up a few words here and there, but... Um, but so, yeah, we used to have John Da Silva. I'll never forget John Da Silva. We, he would put, translate all the. Uh, all the is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he was. Well, he, he was from Portugal, John. But yeah, he was from Portugal. Yeah. yeah. Is that is it Da Silva's like Smith? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no problem. No problem. Thank you.